Welcome back. This is our Applied Regression Analysis Series. I'm Mark Ledbetter, and this is Lecture Video 6, Review of Basic Statistics, Part 2. In this video, we're going to do discrete probability distributions and uh, then talk about specifically the binomial distribution. So first, we want to define a discrete random variable. We use capital letters near the end of the alphabet, X, Y. We can use others, but this is the common practice. A random variable is a function that assigns a real number to each outcome in a discrete sample space. Okay, So that may surprise you. We'll show what that means in just a second. And a discrete probability distribution can be written as a table, a graph, or just a list of the probabilities for each value of the discrete random variable. So here's an example of a discrete random variable. We want um, the four different levels of undergraduates at college so freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, those are not numbers. So a random variable x is taking freshman and assigning zero. And this would be for how many years, let's say, of college has been completed. Not in process, but completed. So zero for freshmen, one for sophomore, etc. So now we can make a probability distribution. These, the, total number, the total probability has to add up to one or it's not a probability distribution. So x is on the top. And we could make a, a, a vertical table like this uh, if we want to, but uh, to save space, x we goes from 0, 1, 2, and 3. And then the probabilities are here. And there's two ways to write this. We could use probability of little x, which would be like 0, so p of 0, p of 1, p of 2. Or we can be a little more specific and say the probability capital X, which is our random variable, is equal to little x, which is the actual value. So for the first one, it would be the probability that capital X is equal to 0. That is equal to 0.35. Okay, so these, this is how you write the probability function. Now here is the same probability distribution but as a graph. Notice that I have a title, I have an x-axis label and a y-axis label, and then I have labels for each value, 0, 1, 2, 3. You don't have to put the freshman, sophomore, junior, etc. Okay, and I've put the numbers up here so it's very easy to see what these values are. So that's what a, in general, a discrete probability distribution is like. Now let's talk about a very special one, and it's called the binomial distribution. And there are four requirements that you need to know. You need to be able to identify these. Uh, so sometimes, uh, especially when you're taking a probability course and, or in real life when there's different probability distributions available to you, um, you need to be able to identify it. So here are the four requirements. There are two possible outcomes. Now don't let this fool you. There, there can be uh, multiple outcomes just like there was with the undergraduates in the previous example. But um, I'm only interested in one of those categories. Let's say I'm interested in seniors and so I can make it two categories, seniors and not seniors. So seniors and everybody else. Now we've labeled the, the convention is to label them as success and failure, but there's an issue with that. If we say are studying mortality, we're interested in predicting death, well now by this notation death becomes a success. So take the word success with a grain of salt. It doesn't, it's not literal. It just means this is the category we're interested in studying. There has to be a fixed number of trials. In other words, it can't be like the geometric distribution where we're waiting for the first success. No, this we're saying we're going to do something so many times or we, we take a sample of in and it's fixed, it doesn't change um, for that, that time. And then the in trials have to be independent. If they're independent, that means the probability that one that occurs on one and the uh, versus the other trials, they don't affect each other. So that means that the probability of success, which is denoted by little p, is constant for all n trials. And here is the formula. The probability that x is equal to i. Now here, you need to write down that x is the number of successes, or the number of times that the category of interest has occurred. And so I can go from 0 all the way up to n. So we can have 0 successes all the way up to n successes. We can't have anything outside of that. So we have a combination n choose i times p raised to the ith power times q raised to the n minus ith power. Notice that the exponents here 
add up to n. That's an important thing that we can use to make sure we've done it right. Q is just equal to 1 minus P, so P plus Q is equal to 1. And N choose I can be written as N factorial divided by I factorial times N minus I factorial. Again, notice that these values on the bottom, if you added I plus N minus I, you get N, which is on the top. And if x is a binomial distribution, we can write x distributed as, that's the tilde, either little b or capital B, both have been used, n comma p. So with n and p, we can fully define the uh, binomial distribution, because if I know p, I know q, it's 1 minus p. And I know n, then i can go from 0 to n. I fully defined it. Now let's talk about the sample proportion, p hat. And p hat is equal to x over n, but here again, x is equal to the number of trials that result in success, or the number of successes in the sample or population. The mean of the whole population, binomial distribution, is mu equal to n times p, so pretty easy there. And the standard deviation of the binomial distribution, sigma, is equal to n times p times q, and take the square root. So those are pretty easy. Now we're going to uh, do a quick example. Okay, let's do an example here of the binomial distribution. Uh, so example one, so let's say a professor, me, has a probability of success in shooting free throws of p equals 0 0.2. I'm being very generous to myself. My probability of being successful at free throws is probably much less than that, but let's pretend. So the first thing I need to do and the first thing you need to do for this problem is to write down that x is equal to the number of successful free throws. Make sure you define what x is. And then q, of course, will be 1 minus 0 0.2 or 0 0.8. And what we're looking for, it says, is that the probability that I make at least one, that is the probability that x is one or more. So that's greater than or equal to one. And then if I say, um, uh, that would be, I could write this as the probability that x is equal to 1 plus the probability x is equal to 2. And I have to do this all the way up to the probability that x is equal to n, which is 10. That means I have to make 10 calculations using this formula right here. And that is not a reasonable request if I were to ask you that on a test. So we want to be smarter than that. And so we're going to rewrite this as 1 minus the probability that x is less than 1. Now, this is the complement, so x less than 1. Notice that this has the equal sign, so this cannot. And the only value of x that's less than 1 is 0. Sorry. 1 minus the probability of 0. So I need to figure out the probability that x is equal to 0. I'm going to use my formula, n, n is 10 for a, okay, and it is for b as well. So this is going to be 10, choose 0, times p, which is 0.2, raised to the i, i is 0 here, times q, which is 0.8, raised to the 10 minus 0. And so 10 factorial over 0 factorial times 10 minus 0 factorial. Remember that 0 factorial is 1, not 0. Okay. And then we have 0 0.2 raised to the 0. This is 1. And then, so we have 1, and then we have 0.8 raised to the 10. Well, here I have 10 factorial, 10 minus 0 is 10 factorial, so these two cancel out, and I'm left with 0.8 to the 10. Now, that's not my answer. I don't want the probability that x is 0. I want that it's at least 1. So now I can say the probability that x is at least 1 is equal to 1 minus the probability of 0 here, which is 1 minus 0.8 to the 10. Notice that with a decimal raised to a large exponent. I don't write that out until the end. I'm just going to plug this into my calculator. I'm going to say 1 minus 0 0.8 to the tenth is equal to 0 0.8926.
and I'll put a squiggly line. That's the four decimal places I've rounded. Okay, so there's an 89.26% chance that I'm going to get at least one successful free throws, which is much higher than I would expect. <laughs> So now we want the mean and standard deviation. The mean is n times p, so always write out the equation you're using, and then substitute n. So n is 10, p is 0.2, this gives me 2. And 0.0 using a round-off rule. We always go one more decimal place. And then sigma is equal to the square root of n p q, and that is equal to the square root of 10 times 2 times 0.8 which is the square root of 1.6, which is approximately equal to, to four decimal places, 1.2649. So uh, I'm going to more decimal places there just to, uh, just to show you a little more uh, information. But we, would, we should round this to 1.3. Um, so... That means that the standard deviation is 1.26, thereabouts, uh, successful free throws. And so mu is 2.0 successful free throws. All right. <clears throat> so please don't forget to scan your lecture notes before midnight on the date that this video is due. You'll find that on your course calendar. With your lecture notes, please be neat, and that's for you. And remember that your lecture notes have to be saved in the Google Drive. Um, please don't email them to me. Uh, be neat, and this is for you, so you can read them and study for the test and use them for the homework. And make sure that you update your formula sheet. And if you have any questions, you're welcome to come to my virtual office hours or email me. I'll be glad to help you. So see you next time.